When we think of ovarian cancer, you think of the very highly malignant, very poor prognosis cancer of epithelial cell carcinoma. But there's more to ovarian cancer than just ovarian cancer. There's multiple types and multiple subtypes. So in order to understand all of the different kinds of ovarian cancer, you have to be able to draw a cross-section of the ovary with the epithelial layer on the outside, germ cells within the stroma, and between the epithelial cells and the germ cells is the stroma, where there are stromal cells. First, the germ cells actually have a pretty good prognosis. And they come in a couple of forms. The dysgerminomas are the seminomas of testicular cancer. They are exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy and they can be tracked with an LDH. The endometrial sinus tumors, the yolk sac, can be tracked with an alpha feta protein. The teratomas, the dermoid cysts, don't really have a cancer marker, but can cause stroma ovarii. In girls, teratomas are usually not malignant as opposed to in boys where they are. And finally, choriocarcinoma can occur in the ovary tracked by beta HCG. Now a germ cell tumor has a pathology that is non-malignant. And commonly occurs in teenage girls. Because they're non-malignant, these just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so they're going to present as an adnexal mass. maybe with some weight gain. And because they are non-malignant, they present at stage one. They never invade the basement membrane despite how big they get. And the way you diagnose ovarian cancer, regardless of the type that it is, because it's an agnexal mass, you're gonna start with a transvaginal ultrasound. To treat it, you want to be conservative. Remember, these are young girls who eventually want to have kids. It's going to be problematic that they have a giant mass, you have to get rid of it, but rather than taking out all of their GYN structures as we will with epithelial cell ovarian cancer, we can simply do a unilateral salpingo oophorectomy, leave the rest of it, re reserve her ability to continue through puberty and to have kids later on down the line. If we compare that to the epithelial cell tumors, this is the one you think of that has the poor prognosis. It also has a bunch of different types. Cirrus, mucinous, and endometroid, along with Brenner's tumor. These are all considered cyst adenocarcinoma. This is very different than the germ cell tumor. The pathogenesis of these tumors is epithelial trauma, which essentially means ovulation. The more ovulations a patient has, the more likely they are to develop this tumor. Because each time you ovulate, the epithelial cell ruptures, the lining ruptures, and allows the egg to come out. And these are going to be extremely malignant. The patient is going to be someone who has suffered multiple ovulations. So risk increases with age, generally postmenopausal. The idea being, if the older she is, the more ovulation she has had. 
Likewise, someone who was never pregnant or had low number of pregnancies thereby had more ovulations and is at increased risk. Conversely, the use of OCPs, which prevent ovulation, are going to decrease the risk of epithelial cell tumors, as well as someone who has had multiple pregnancies. Unfortunately, these usually present as stage 3B, or worse. And the reason for that is that they are generally asymptomatic. The ovaries are in the peritoneum. They're not near anything. So they're not going to abut against something. They're not going to provoke symptoms. And they seed peritoneally. which means they spread quickly to organs around them. In advanced stages, you might have renal failure, small bowel obstructions, or ascites. In fact, if you see a question about a postmenopausal female with ascites and it's not due to liver disease, think epithelial cell ovarian cancer. And finally, people with specific genetic syndromes, in particular BRCA1, also BRCA2, and the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, Lynch syndrome, these patients who have genes significantly predisposes their risk for epithelial cell cancers. Unfortunately, there is no screening tool. And attempts to find these cancers using screens result in finding the cancer at 3B or worse, no different than just taking the normal clinical course. Because it's an ovarian tumor, the first thing you're going to do is investigate with a transvaginal ultrasound. This identifies the mass. Then you're going to get a CT scan in order to stage. And you can track these tumors using the CA-125. Unlike germ cell tumors, which were very conservative, the treatment of these tumors is extremely aggressive. Generally, she's postmenopausal. So she doesn't need her GYN organs anymore. So you take them all out. A total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. Because they're usually 3B or worse, they're going to need chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is with paclitaxel. And there's a special consideration you need to make. In people who have BRCA1, in particular BRCA1, when you can also justify it in BRCA2, you can screen. You screen these patients annually with a transvaginal ultrasound and with a CA-125. And when she's done having kids, and generally because pregnancies starting at age 35 or older don't do very well, you can actually do a prophylactic total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy at age 35. This eliminates a risk of developing a potentially fatal tumor. A lot of information about epithelial cell. This is the one we usually talk about when we say ovarian cancer because it kills people. But there are also one last segment we need to talk about very briefly. It's going to be the stromal cell tumors. And there are two of them. The granulosa theca. Granulosa theca tumors produce estrogen and Sertoli Leydig. Sertoli Leydig tumors produce testosterone. So there's really two ways an ovarian cancer can present, either as a big mass from the epithelial cell cancers or the germ cell cancers, or by endocrine abnormalities. And I'm not going to talk about these so much because they're going to come up in other areas where the endocrine effects are greater than the mass effects. So just recognize that there's germ cells, epithelial cells, and stromal cells, and you should suspect an ovarian cancer whenever you have endocrine abnormalities of estrogen and testosterone or an adnexal mass. So let's briefly talk about how you handle an adnexal mass in the diagnosis of ovarian cancer. The patient comes in complaining of an adnexal mass, or you find one on an annual exam. Hopefully by now you've recognized the transvaginal ultrasound is the way to start. If you see 
a smooth, small cyst without septations, you have a simple cyst. And a simple cyst is physiologic. You're going to have a whole lecture on agnexal masses later on down the road. So just take for granted right now that if you have a cyst, simple cyst, you can simply stop. No additional investigation needs to be made because it's probably not a cancer. On the other hand, if you have a large cyst that's not smooth, it's full of septations, and the fluid is loculated, now you have a complex cyst. Biopsy is going to be the best way to diagnose it as an actual cancer, but you can generally determine from their age and their symptoms what type of tumor it's going to be. And that is if it is in a young girl, a teenager, with an asymptomatic mass, you're probably going to have a germ cell tumor. Germ cell tumors need to be treated conservatively with unilateral salpingo oophorectomy. Leave her ability to have kids and to complete puberty. On the other hand, if she's older and asymptomatic, or there's earlier small bowel obstruction or ascites, you probably have that epithelial tumor where you need to be very aggressive. Total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, generally with paclitaxel chemotherapy. And so hopefully now you can see that ovarian cancer doesn't really mean anything, that there are different subtypes. But generally, when you get a question on USMLE or when you're discussing with someone ovarian cancer, they mean epithelial cell cancer because those cancers have terrible prognoses and are the things you're going to see most often in postmenopausal females who have ovarian masses. That is ovarian cancer. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.